uh, very pleased to be here, Mr. Thank you all for coming here. So, if you can occupy the front seat, it will be proper. It will be better for us. Yeah. Okay. So, so, once again, good evening. So, I'd like to start the session. So, I just have a few questions and thoughts. So, so when compared to Silicon Valley, Europe, and South Korea, so uh, about innovations, do we hear about innovations in India? Not a lot, right? And uh, we have stories from Samsung, IKEA, Tesla, Apple, of uh, the innovation sounds fascinating, but we don't hear too much, uh, too many news about innovation from India. Uh, so after this thought, our speaker here, Mr. Vijay Menon, in 2016, he went looking for stories of innovation in India, uh, in various workplaces, and met various leaders, as you can see, uh, like uh, Mr. Ratan Tata, Aire Godrej, Suresh Krishna, and many more. And, and he had one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. So this book is the result of that conversation and journey. And he's going to share the real-life examples of these companies and gentlemen about how the companies have innovated themselves and forged forward. So now I'd like to call upon our charter member, Mr. Vinod Harit, to the stage to introduce our speaker for the day. Thank you. It's always a little tricky to introduce your former boss to find all the right things to say. Uh, but I don't have a problem with Vijay because um, more than a boss, he's been a great friend and a mentor. In fact, uh, 17 years back, uh, he's the one who pushed me out of my comfort zone when I was valuing and one. Um, so I owe a lot to him uh, for what I've made today. So, um, the other thing I've always admit about uh, Vijay is uh, his uh, ability to straddle multiple career paths. We are all struggling to you know, uh, take one career path and stick to it. He's been a nuclear scientist for a few years and then moved on and been a very successful journalist with you know, business life in India today. And then he's moved on and been a marketeer for many years with uh, organizations like Ramco, SSI, Infosys, um, and Quest. And uh, now I think it's his fourth uh, career path now uh, as an author. So it never ceased to amaze me. Um, the other thing I've always admired about uh, Vijay is his ability to tell fascinating stories or tell things in a very fascinating way. He's always got uh, uh, an art of putting things in a very simple, lucid way with a lot of examples and a lot of uh, anecdotes. So uh, I'm really hoping that uh, we'll get to see more of that today and uh, also in this book. So without um, more any more uh, delay, I'd like to invite uh, the gentleman. also prevents um, sustained innovation. When I talk to leaders of large companies, a lot of them frankly hate Jugar. And I'll give you the biggest example of that. I was talking to the head of a pharma company, in this case, um, Dr. Reddy's. And he said, you know, a lot of pharma companies in India tend to be caught uh, in FDA violations. And the reason is cultural. FDA rules are tough, but they're predictable, they don't change, it's easy to do business in the USA. What happens is that in my office I have a culture. If there's a piece of grass and there's a path around it and there's a board called keep off the grass, I put it there for a reason, we put it there for a reason. But rather than go like that, people tend to work across the grass. That's to guard it gets there faster but the FDA catches you that do it on a regulated process. Um, I keep talking about Jugaad and I want you to find out what is Jugaad. Also on a lighter note, this is Jugaad. It's supposed to be a Punjabi and a Hindi word. It stands for a contraption that is powered by a pump set with basic mechanical and carpentry skills. It gets people and goods moving. 
but it's going to fail every regulatory test. Regard has become the metaphor for what we do. Um, short term fixes, it gets the work done, but uh, there are problems. I also um, want to set expectations. I don't pretend to be an expert in innovation. Obviously, I'm not. The thing is, as a writer, I went on a journey. I went and met people who have successfully run businesses through multiple business cycles. And the question I asked them was, all of you are very successful. And that's a given. Most of these are publicly listed companies. You can analyze them. What makes you successful? What were the decisions you took at various points of time in your career? What choices did you make? In hindsight, some of those choices look brilliant. But when you're actually doing that, there's a lot of uncertainty. As every manager knows, there are multiple decision paths. Which do you take? Which do you forego? Is always the tough call. That, I thought, was a great story to tell. The other thing was, you hear a fair amount of commentary on Jugaad versus sustained innovation. There's a whole body of work by academics, by consultants, by practitioners. And uh, what tends to happen is that, um, is that um, people um, People aren't very sure what paths to take. How do you do it across industries? The idea was to go to as diverse a group as possible. And uh, that is what I've tried to do. Uh, yeah. OK, uh, before that, let me just also set the context, regard versus innovation. Um, there is evidence for the fact that we aren't particularly good at sustained innovation. There is a Global Innovation Index, which a lot of you must be familiar with. This is put out by worthy organizations like Connor, NCR, and the World Intellectual Property Organization. They've been doing it for seven years now. And they look at a whole bunch of data, macroeconomic data, education, R&D spending, output in terms of patterns, business results, and so on. Um, it's a fairly comprehensive thing. And if you see the, the ranking, the top 24 out of 25 countries that rank high in innovation are actually high income countries. High income as defined by the World Bank classification. Um, the World Bank says that uh, if you have a GNI per capita, gross national income per capita of less than about 1,000, then you're classified as low income. If it's, if it's about 12,000, it's high income. And this is vast swathe in the middle. India, with a GNI per capita of 1680, is firmly in the lower middle income group. Uh, just to set the context, our neighbor Sri Lanka is much better than us. China is way better than us. And USA and Switzerland are right there at the top. So there is a very, very high correlation between rich countries and innovation. And there's nothing you can do about that. But things are not as bad as they seem, because if you look at the commentary around the press release, even though we rank 60th globally, um, we have several things going for us. Compared to our peer group, if you look at a GDP per capita peer group, we do um, a hell of a lot better than our peer group income-wise. On the input side, we have several strengths. Uh, Good science and engineering. All these experts, I mean, all this you know intuitively. Um, there's gross capital formation, gross domestic expenditure on R&D performed by business and research talent. And on the output side, we have uh, higher quality of scientific publications, uh, growth rate, um, good high tech and ICT services, creative groups, somewhat of manufacture and IP creation. These are the things that work for you. India also has a very, very, very vibrant private sector. So it is interesting to actually go to this ranking and then look at the good private sector companies who are disproportionately bigger than the, or, or who are more 
innovative and creative than the average. And that's what I try to do. I try to uh, access the heads. And when I say heads, I actually mean the decision maker, not the influencer, not the guy who sits in the committee, but the, the, the head of the organization. And I tried to be as diverse as I could. So I looked at conglomerates, I looked at the Indian arm of MNCs, I looked at large and mid-sized companies, and I looked at some startups. Um, the, as you can imagine, it's extremely difficult getting access to these guys. The only notable absentees in this group, I think, are Indigo and Maruti. I would love to talk to Indigo because I don't have aviation there. And I would love to talk to a passenger car guy, but I couldn't get access to them. This is just to show you the diversity in terms of uh, size, in terms of sectors, whatever. And these are the people who are represented in that first slide. Um, all these are the heads of those organizations. Tata Godrej, Suresh Krishna, TBS. Uh, the other three are the MNCs, Munish Matkija, it's uh, the Jack Welch Technology Center for Jeep. Suresh Narayanan is for Nestle, Philip Khandevar, SAG Labs, AMI, LMD. I mean, the whole list. So if you see the book, you can see that. Aditya Puri's HDFC Bank, Narayanan Muthi, Infi, Shaji, used to, till recently, head the Commercial Vehicles Division of Tata Motors, ABS Heads, Asian Paints. Uh, GB Prasad, Dr. Reddy's Laboratories, Titan, Pascal Bud, Maripo, uh, Biocon, Oberoi Hotels, Himalaya, uh, uh, Dr. Devi Shetty Narayana, Fab India, Kiran Kulaf heads. Uh, it is interesting because Chlorophyll is the company he heads. And advertising is one industry where a whole bunch of MA has happened, so there are hardly any Indian advertising companies. So he heads up. Uh, Grand consultancy called Chlorophyll, which so far is, has been decidedly Indian. Uh, Vijay Shankar Sharma, KTM, Raghu Bell of Quint. Team Indus is, is something you must be familiar with. It's, it's pure romance. There's a little team in Bangalore that put an office next to the Jakur Airport. They won the Google uh, Prize and they have an audacious goal by December 31st. They have to put a craft, a, a small rover on the moon, it has to go for half a kilometer and it has to beam back images. That is the challenge. So eight teams in the world have qualified, uh, all from fairly rich countries. These guys started off with zero funding. They got funding from well-meaning individuals like Ananda Nilakar, Ratan Taka, and a whole bunch of other guys. But it's an expensive affair. If it happens, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's literally a moonshot. And, and they'll either spectacularly succeed or spectacularly fail. We will know where it's at the 31st. I found the really deserved it. Now, the, there are two ways you can do an innovation talk. One is to be the expert. I mean, if you're a professor or a consultant, you've done your research, you've done your surveys, and you pontificate. I mean, there are learnings to be given, lessons to be given. I'm not that. Or you could be a practitioner and say, okay, I ran Paytm or I ran Flipkart and these are the 10 things I did and these are my learnings. As I said, I'm going to take the approach of a writer who's met these people and, and talked to them. Each of them spent approximately about 45 minutes to one hour with me. And the, the tough, tough thing was to get access, but once you get access, it was amazing how candidly they spoke. So, I did my homework before meeting them. I, I, I looked at the research reports of financial analysis and stuff like that. So I had my questions, I had the conversation going. And after they spoke, I validated what they spoke by speaking to uh, outside experts and uh, public available literature websites and stuff like that. And in each case, I was, I was wondering how to actually structure this narrative because there was a whole bunch of things they said. So if you if you've written it as a conventional media article like he said, she said, it really doesn't capture that 45 minutes of conversation that you had. So I, I wrote it down as a first person account, sent it back to them, um, and, and, and then you write a narrative, obviously there are gaps because you have fill a narrative. What they have told you was disjointed facts. So you build a narrative, and in every case, I had it uh, vetted by them, and that's the book. So what I want to do 
from now on is actually try and um, to add a bit of drama to play a quote from a selection of these people. It is unfair to reduce a man's an hour of a man's conversation to a quote. But uh, I've tried to select um, phrases or sentences that seem to me to reflect different facets of innovation, issues they face. And at the end of it, we might end up having looked at this whole thing of innovation from different angles. People have different, different perspectives. They look at it through different prisms. And then let's try and weave together common themes. So, so what, if anything, was common? What was different? And at the end, to help you wrap your head around this, uh, I want to share um, a framework. So there is a famous Eight Essentials of Innovation Framework, uh, which is put out by McKinsey. And that is just to, and it's amazing, uh, how many of these experiences, many of these quotes, tend to map to that McKinsey framework. I mean, there are other frameworks, but I, I thought McKinsey was good because they've spent more than eight years on this. It seems good. Um, I just want to play this, and then let me talk about. So one of the hindrances of innovation is that you're never given a free chance to express yourself. And it's always looked at in a negative sense in a, in a large company. I think the environment itself has changed over the years and it has today it is much more conducive to innovation than, than it was in the past. To me, this, this quote from him seemed to symbolize everything that Tata um, deeply felt about. He said that after he finished his architecture degree from Cornell, he's, he worked for two or three years in the US. It was an architecture degree, but he worked in a firm that was making stands and gantries for the first of the space rocket Saturn or something like that. So he said, I ended up working on those stands for the rockets. And it was fascinating because I was very young, but the science was young, the industry was young, and there was no old guy or a wise guy telling you that, let's do it this way, this is the only right way. So I said, after Cornell, I worked in a company where the culture was, if you're a young guy and you have an idea, the feedback was, all right, go do it. He said, I did that. And then, of course, he was J.R.D. Tata's protege. He came back to India to basically get into the family business. And he said, I spent three years on the shop floor at Delco and now it's called Tata Motors and, and Steel, Tata Steel and Delco. And he said, those three years, I thought were the biggest waste of my life. In retrospect, I know it taught me a lot of things. I know that I got shop floor experience. I know it, I mean, it helped me stand shoulder to shoulder with uh, industrial labor, unionized labor, all of that. But he said, at that point of time, I was really, really frustrated. Because with, with all my uh, experience and degrees and my cockiness, I thought that I had plenty of things to offer an old established hierarchy. And I would go and say, let's do it this way. They said, no, we'll listen to you when you have some white hair on your head. Go back to your desk. So that was deeply frustrating. So he said that when he rose through the ranks in Tata, he always remembered that there was always going to be a young guy, because like all companies, they, they recruit very, very smart people. There's always going to be a young person with an idea, and he's always going to be squashed unless you, you sort of enable it. So he said it was an era much before startups or anything like that, but within the company, I tried to foster this. So if people came with an idea, I sort of encouraged it. And he had a phrase. He said, sometimes it ended in grief, sometimes it ended in success. But that was a risk I was prepared to take. I think he said that that was a philosophy that came fully into play when uh, he set up this whole dream project of the passenger car. Because on the commercial vehicle side, there was an established hierarchy process way of doing things, supply chain and all of that. But when he started the passenger car project, the idea was to make a very Indian car at low cost, 
So he went to the established vendor. A car is made up of over 2,000 parts. So let's set up a supply chain. So he goes to the Lucas's, he goes to the Heller's, and all of that. And they all work with established people. He said, so the big companies were coming to me, Hyundai, Suzuki, Toyotas. But all of them come with an ecosystem, and those ecosystems are close to an outsider. And philosophically, he wanted to encourage an Indian industry. So he sets up a supply chain. And he said that in many cases, I and my executives have gone to people, uh, first generation, second generation entrepreneurs, and said that you set up um, a vendor mechanism for, for, for the Tata car. We'll give you the first order. That's how the supply chain actually gets set up for the Indica and the Nico. Finally, of course, the fruition of that was the Nano, which was really a lot of frugal engineering. And uh, in many cases, it works. In many cases, it doesn't work. I actually asked him a question which I've always wanted to ask him. I said, how is it that you know many of us are from great colleges, how is it that a company like Tata can hire really, really smart engineers and produce a piece of garbage like the first Indica, something like that. He said, no, you know, I don't want to sound defensive, but if you look at the core, if you look at transmission, if you look at the mechanicals, we aren't so bad. Where we lack is in fit and finish. And there are two reasons for that. The reason is that one is it's going to take us 20, 30 years to get to the level of any of the MNCs. And the second, and that is cultural, and that's, I think, very rooted in, in, in something that we need to fix, is that as a country, we lack the rigor to wrestle quality and cost from our supply chain. He said, even if you know a thing is not coming to the level that you want, we still seem to lack the ability to hammer the kind of quality that you, you need to get out of that system. And I think that was fairly profound because, and, and he actually mapped it to something that's happening to Tata right now. In fact, if, if, if you've seen the paper today, the big news, of course, was Infosys. But if you see Mint, there's another story uh, by Watsala Kamath, which talks about the troubles that uh, Tata Motors, a company that I did speak to, Tata Motors was dominant in the trucks section, in the commercial vehicles, but their market share has been constantly slipping from about 60 to now about 49 or so. And there's a problem. And he says very candidly, I go to a, you know, a, a, a machine line, an assembly line of a competitor like a Daimler Benz, and they seem to have a different DNA. So how do I get our trucks to that level because India has changed. Earlier, India was a low-tech truck country, so uh, our roads were bad. They were, they were, they, uh, our trucks were overloaded. There were, there were many check posts. You had to stop. So the big guys stayed away. Um, now, with with a better infrastructure, it's still not great, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was previously. The big guys are bringing their technology because it was it didn't make any sense for them to bring their trucks to India then. So now that the Daimler Benzes or the Man or whoever are bringing the trucks in, Tata Motors is facing massive competition. Now, how do you change this DNA? And this DNA has to change, otherwise it's going to be wiped out. I mean, he's losing market share unless he addresses that. And they have all sorts of other problems. I mean, the, uh, they've had eight, uh, four CEOs in eight years, so they have a problem. But there are also cultural problems like how do you get quality up and, and that's exactly what he was talking about, the supply chain quality. So I think that was something that was very, very uh, close to his heart. And he, he makes comparisons. I mean, he's a man who's, who's been around the world. So he says, some of it seems to be intrinsic. For instance, uh, countries like Germany or countries like Japan have are intrinsically perfectionist by nature. They want to make great stuff. Other countries like China were not, but they have made themselves to be very, very quality conscious. And they've done it in a certain way. You can argue about political systems and stuff like that, but the end result is are you making a good product or not? He thinks that we have a way to go before we reach that. 
that on scale is his perspective. I, I leave you with that. I want to talk about another perspective. I, I'm going to give you a different facet. So, I mean, these are not closed end conversations. These are not end results by themselves. We'll talk about it later. Suresh Krishna was fascinating. Indian companies always have problems uh, with labor. They have, uh, either they are totally divorced from the labor and leave it to professional managers to manage them and take in their stride uh, disruption of workforce, uh, strikes, uh, stoppages, uh, grievances, whatever it is. Very, very few companies get totally involved in the welfare of the uh, industrial labor. And industrial labor, the importance of industrial labor is very, very, uh, I mean, it's terribly overlooked in, the, in India. When I met Suresh Krishna as the chairman of TVS, he said it makes no sense to talk to me as the chairman of TVS. TVS is a fairly large group. It's run by family <coughs> members with all sorts of different philosophies. So let me talk about Sundaram Fastness, which he personally has headed. And he said, I want to talk about something that is terribly neglected. He, for him, this is a passion. The, the man speaks with reason. He's run Sundaram Fastness for 50 years, and they haven't lost a single day to industrial unrest. How many companies can say that? There's a whole bunch of things he has done. Um, it encompasses massive employee welfare schemes. Employees are very well taken care of. But uh, at the heart of it, I think he feels very strongly about the fact that people tend to outsource it to professional managers. If you're not committed to investment, maybe then you have a problem. He, he, he goes back to how he learned the ropes. I mean, for those of you from Chennai, I mean, this is a, a legendary story that everyone knows. The story starts with the TBS bus service in Madurai, and it was said that you could set your watch by the TBS bus. And he says, how did we actually arrive at that? So he says, I have seen my father as a boy. I have seen my father do these midnight shift talks. All the buses would come after the, after the last sh shift, and they would come to the depot at midnight. And his father would, would go and speak to everyone, the bus conductor, the supervisor, the manager, the shift in charge. And he said, he would talk about everything. He would talk about the business. He would talk about the country. He would talk about you know, life in general. And he said he was fascinated by that. He saw that as a boy. And when he, when he started running Sundaram Fastness, he just continued that tradition. So he says, I, I, I did it when we were very small in Amatur and Padi. Now he's an 8,000 person organization. He still does it. And he says it has several advantages. Again, I, I speak to them over everything. And I, I speak to them. He spoke to the world about when the time was right, perestroika and all of that, Indian economy, the company, macroeconomics, politics. What happens, he says, over a period of years is that you, you build something fairly um, tenuous called trust. And since the MD is speaking to you, there is no second guessing. You heard it from the guy who runs the organization. You cannot second guess that message. And he says, I speak the truth. I don't. I try not to hide anything because it's difficult to remember what lie you said yesterday. So he's, he, he says, I tend to speak the truth. Over a period of years, what has happened is that employees trust you. So if I tell them good news, bad news, whatever, they take it as this is what is the truth. He then marries it to a concept that he calls dharma. Now, I found something very interesting in all these conversations. I deliberately chose the first person, and I actually wanted to play the clips to you. Because if I say these things to you, or if, if you read it in a magazine, or in, even in the book, they seem, you know, these are things that seem very simple. These are mom and pop statements. But these are people who have grown businesses, they've lived through it, they, and, and, and you can see it in their body language and speech. They say it with a weight of conviction because they've lived through it. So he says, what these things uh, do to the organization is that, you know, people talk about mission, mission, purpose. He says, okay, what is my dharma as a company? My dharma as a company 
is that I pick people from fairly poor backgrounds. He's talking about the blue collar people, not the managers. So these are people who come at a young age with a few rupees in their pocket. And after, and people have very, very long tenures in mysterious companies, at least in his. And after 30, 35 years, they retire out, they've got houses, the health is taken care of by the company, sometimes two houses, the kids are married, the son has a job. Today, in most cases, the daughter also has a job. And he says, so what, what has happened over these 20, 30 years is that this kid who came out of that small town or village in wherever, is now able to give his family a standard of living that was undreamt of for him. That, to him, was the dharma of his company. And it needs to uplift. In return, and he, and he says, I see absolutely no dichotomy in talking, taking this paternalistic approach. And I talked to them about Kanban and TQ. And remember, the evidence is that Sundaram Fastness, for years together, was always a very highly, highly rated uh, supplier for General Motors, and he's won all sorts of awards. And then he says, my own children tell me, this, this ain't going to work. World has changed. Nobody wants a father figure. People are more aspirational. He says, I have no quarrel with you. I can only tell you what has worked for me. Um, and he says, and let me tell you that I haven't had a problem in my company. My company does well. And he firmly believes that, that when labor comes into the company, we Indians are like that, he says. You look for a robo parentis, you look for a paternalistic figure, you look for direction. I tend to give that. He's completely unapologetic about it. As I said, a complete, I've, I've also spoken to, to the new generation of managers who completely jumped this theory. But that's OK. My whole idea is to present facets. This is what Sundaram Fasteners told me. I wanted to present a MNC, MNC perspective. Suresh Narayanan is the chairman and managing director of Nestle India. Nestle India was a fascinating study because they were in the news. Nestle, I spoke to. Uh, Sandeep Dhingra, then of J.P. Morgan, today is a fund manager in uh, Singapore. And he had a very interesting thing to say. He said, yes, TCS may well have pioneered it, but TCS was a very opaque company. We didn't know what was going on there. They had no uh, breakouts. There was no commentary. There was no management discussion. So whatever they did, fine. But Infi was the one that went out to the world, said, this is the model we're going to follow. This is the execution that they're going to do. And, and they sold it to the financial services industry. And the financial services industry is the biggest consumer of IT services. And therefore, he did two things. I mean, he sold this company, obviously, but he also sold India as a powerhouse. So I think the man was responsible for a major, major revolution in, in India, IT services. And he, he, OK, now, I went to him with a slightly mischievous question. I said, all right. So there was always this. Um, charge against Narayana Murthy, then you know, at the core, there was nothing really to distinguish a TCS from an Infosys to a Diploma. The premise was that you hired smart engineers, they would code, and you, you service trusting customers. They were happy, ergo your business model. So the charge was that in, in, in Infosys, they talk about the core versus context branding. At its core, the promise was smart engineers program for customers, and we deliver. What was the context? The context was that Western customers were wary of engaging with India because of all the horror stories that you heard. Oh, India, half a world away. Oh, India, infrastructure poor. Oh, India, dodgy governance practices. So everything that they did was actually meeting a market need. So, and, and I think some of it he genuinely feels you can't be excellent in one dimension. Uh, Mohandas Pai actually has a great story. Mohandas Pai, at that time CFO and all that, he said, all right, people ask us, why have you built these wonderful campuses and spending so much money? Because if you look at the competitors, it's, they have offices. So he says, so let me tell you a story. There are 10 people who get up on a plane from the US, and you know that five of them are anyway saying, you know, I don't think this is a great idea. And five of them are boat race, which is why, I mean, someone is pushed. 
outsourcing and all that. They get on a plane and they land in Delhi or Bombay and they get out of the airport and they say, you know guys, I told you this was a mistake. And then first to Bangalore. So they come to Bangalore and they go on a postal road and say, you know this was a mistake. <laughs> so even the five guys who are your sympathizers are now very defensive. Hmm. And then they come to our campus. And the five guys say, yes, we told you it was a good idea. So he says, that is why we spend money on offices. Yes, I mean, it's great for employees in the food courts and the gyms and all that, but it makes hard business sense. So I think, so Murthy sort of says that in a nicer way. The, the other one was definitely go versus context. The transparency issue was major. Um, and, and, and we know it from our personal experience. We used to run investor relations. Um, everything that you accept today as breakout reporting, segment reporting, headcount, capex, all of that, was pioneered by Infosys. It becomes the gold standard of an annual report. When you follow uh, multiple gap sort of reporting, and your financials are out there. And, and I, even today, I see this happening. In fact, later, I will speak about Narayana and Devi Shetty. So Devi Shetty says the same thing. He says, yes, I'm known for affordable health care, but I don't run a charity. Nobody's going to invest in charity. So I run a public li listed company. I'm a public listed company. And anyone who wants to partner with me or put money in my company can go to my website and see all the financials. That is what transparency does. And I think he cracked it. <coughs> so I think that, and, and everything that is happening today, I think it's still, you know, everyone talks about this whole adage, culture is strategy for breakfast. That's what's playing out today. Uh, Infosys needs to pivot. Nobody, uh, you know, denies that. Old models have to continuously change. But what has happened is you, you choose a guy who you think is very good for the company, Exactly like a Ratan Tata chose a Cyrus mystery. And two or three years later, you find, oh, oh maybe your values don't sort of match. Let me talk about patient pains. So, a lot of, all innovation does not succeed, a lot of it fails. Frankly speaking, mm. all new ideas don't work, yes. a lot of them fail. Mm. Because the ideas come from your understanding of the consumer, mm. the consumer may be actually a little different. Mm. KBS Sanand is a professional manager. He's been in Asian Greens for donkey sales. He's the, he's the managing director. He's the managing director. The Hanis and all the promoters are in the whole great executive positions. Uh, Asian Paints has, I think, a 53% market share in paint, which is really odd because the other guys. And and all that. Put together, they don't meet this, which is a pretty odd situation. He makes light of it. I said, What explains your success? He says, Oh, well, I, I think I'm in a lucky category. India is urbanizing. Uh, concrete is being used to build houses. Paint needs to go on concrete. If you choose Asian paints, I'm happy. Uh, well, it's not that simple, of course. It won't. So you didn't have to choose Asian paints. Asian paints is a, is a remarkable story. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I was speaking to some other guy, I think uh, SAP Labs, the head is a guy called Dilip Khandirwal, who's really a very techy software guy. But he says, look, I'm an engineer and a tech guy, but you know, with a name like Khandirwal, I'm a Marwadi. So my family says, buy Asian paint stocks, you'll never lose money. You look at that stock price, you, will never, you would have never lost money on Asian paints. True. Okay. The reason is, Asian paints, uh, and the way Anand says it, he says, you know, in hindsight, a lot of people tell us we were innovative and all that, but it was nothing like that. In the 40s when this company started, the MNCs ruled the roost. So as a late entrant, we were with our backs to the wall and we simply had to do something. So we did something very old-fashioned. We actually went to people who use paint and say, you know, so what can we do for you? So we went to uh, Tamil Nadu, we went to Maharashtra, and they say, you know, I want a small tin of yellow paint or an aquamarine paint. I want to paint the horns of my bull. You know, I want to paint my house for Diwali. He says, so this first insight of paint in small quantities, paints in multifarious colors, came because we actually went and spoke to the customer, something that, you know, after years, the distributor sort of had gotten lazy about. I mean, uh, the European companies were selling paint in pastel shades, and that's it. Like a London. That I think 
sort of has happened again and again. He said the other big innovation that we did historically was uh, he started getting payments in advance. He said in the paint industry traditionally, uh, painting used to happen from Diwali to Diwali. So the payment cycle was about a year. And you said pay for this Diwali and you collect money the next year. As a small company, they couldn't have such large outstanding receivables. So they went and incentivized people. They said, if you pay as an advance, we'll give you this 5% off, 10% off, and all that. But you must pay 70% of that in advance. He does that. And even today, 70% of Asian pay receivables money comes in advance. Now it has become the industry norm, and it is the industry norm only in India in paint. Um, Asian paints has continued that tradition of using macro and micro uh, market research to constantly innovate. Uh, I, I, I will, re I, I will uh, revert to this theme of people using macroeconomic indicators to bring into effect in the Titan story also. But in Asian pains also, he sees, we saw the trend through multiple census. Disposable incomes were rising, women were getting empowered. So they make the decision. They make the decision that people, and, and, and it comes out of a lot of focus group studies, where somebody says that, uh, you know, I paint my house on Diwali because it's the cheapest way of celebrating. It feels good. They latch onto that. And they move paint from being a maintenance product to a decor product. And they move the cycle. It used to be festival to festival. So they said, so all right, so if, if there's something that makes you feel good, then why don't you do it more than once a year, or why wait for Diwali? So they move the cycle. It's no longer Diwali to Diwali. In fact, that whole campaign around festivals is gone. Um, Asian Paints was famous for that uh, festival sort of communication. Then they had a brilliant campaign called Har Ghar Ke Andar Kuch Kahani Hai and something like that, whatever phrase on there. Har Ghar Kuch Kehta Hai, something like that. Um, he successfully moves the positioning from maintenance to decor. And he enables that because now, increasingly, disposable incomes, women are making the decision. Decor is important. It's no longer paint as maintenance to cover concrete. So you have four finishes, uh, multiple colors, different uh, types of uh, delivery, uh, painting as a service. Asian Paints pioneered that. And he says, my biggest investment in that was actually the color studios. So if you go to Bandra, which is the biggest one in Bombay, it's a massive thing. And they've repeated that in Calcutta and Delhi. But he says, I really can't repeat it too many times in the country because it's horrendously expensive. They don't sell a litter of paint there. If you go to Bandra, if you go to one place, I think, in, uh, or one in Calcutta. What it does is it's a totally immersive experience. You go there, and you can see all sorts of colors, all sorts of finishes. You can virtually see your house, and I mean, you can play around with it. It's virtual reality. And he says, at the end of it, you know, yes. So you're so awed by this, we hope you'll buy paint. And if you want us to paint it, we'll do that for you also. But that's what he's done. And at the back end, he uses technology. He says, in the 70s, Asian Paints becomes one of the first companies to get a mainframe, not for accounting, but for forecasting. Because by that time, the company has grown. There are so many SKUs. So forecasting demand is a horrendous problem. I mean, so dealers are, 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 are anticipating, wrongly anticipating demand, stocking up. There's a huge inventory pile up. It's a big loss. So, so they use uh, technology, mainframe computers, and, and, and this is in the era of those job cards. But he actually uses it for business. And I think he invests in people. He says the guy who set it up was, was a topper from IIM Ahmedabad. So you know, Asian Paints is actually known as an MBA company. A lot of MBAs win their spurs in Asian Paints. And then they move on to other things. But they get a re I think they get top quality talent to set up systems and practices in place. And, uh, and I think this sort of repeats again and again. Uh, Titan is interesting because it gives you a completely uh, different take on market research. We can't lose all that uh, restlessness and that, not restlessness so much, that, that 
we should continue to explore. And so we quite successfully institutionalize this. So in two words, we I'd summarize it. We were able to collectively dream. Mm -hmm. so collective dreaming instead of top driven has become kind of a culture. Titan is fascinating. Bhaskar Bhatt is an alumnus of IIT, Madras, and I am Amitabha. So he's a quantity guy. I mean, he understands numbers, rigor, and analytics, and all of that. Titan has started as a JV between Tata and Tikkoya. They're in Hosu. It starts with a conversation with the Xerxes Desai uh, and the JRD Tata. And he says, the hypothesis was in the 90s, HMT is the market leader, 90% of the market for mechanical watches. So they say, we think the market is ripe for disruption. And let's do quotes. And uh, he said, had we done market research, any fool would have told you that what because HMT was this big and servicing was so complacent, the market was ready for another an HMT clone or HMT competitor. Quartz, at that point of time, remember, was a very tacky piece of engineering. It was not water resistant, it was ugly, it would spoil fast because the, there was no authorized service and the quartz was rubbish. But they take the call saying, hey, quartz is cheaper to do because it is less mechanical parts. We can machine it thinner. We can design it better. So if we can produce a good quartz watch, if we can position it as a fashion accessory, not really as a timepiece, and if we provide an ambience, let's sell it like FMCG. If we provide an ambience to sell it in a slick showroom, hey, let's go for it. He said, that's how Titan started. And we were so buoyed by our success. Titan, you know, the rest is history. I mean, HMT and mechanical watches basically went out of the market. And he said, so that is a call. Market research was actually telling us something else, but you do this, this thing, and, and you follow your gut. And, and you could do it because there was a Desai there, and he's backed by GRE Tata. He says, now we're very happy. And then we make the biggest mistake of our lives. We said, all right, now we're doing, and, and, and this premise seems to be working. Quartz watches are brilliantly designed, and, and they hire graduates from NID and foreign designers. It's a beautiful, it's a, it's a work of art. And uh, they get parts from abroad. Actually, the, the design is Indian, but, and, and the manufacturing is here. And, and they said, OK, our challenge was we will get the movements from somewhere, we'll get the case from somewhere but we will manufacture it in India. The, the challenge is to, to manufacture it beautifully. And hey, if we can't do it and we are the Tatas, then who can? So, so the Tatas contribution is great manufacturing. We said, now this is a wonderful promise, so let's take it out. They go to Europe, and they said, now this is a world product, and they hire uh, great designers in Europe. They hire advertising agencies, communication agencies. They take the story, and they spectacularly bomb. I mean, it's an utter disaster. They, they need to go bankrupt. And I asked him why. He says, you know, looking back, after every analysis and post-mortem, we still don't think there was anything fundamentally wrong in our premise. What we couldn't overcome was the country of origin barrier. It was impossible for the Europeans to accept that great watches could come out of India. Chocolates come from Swiss. Cars come from Germany. <coughs> India cannot make great watch watches in their story. And, and the Europeans are very insular that way. I mean, they still prefer to buy European brands. All right, he says, enter Tanishk, the jewelry brand. Again, he says, now he, then he goes very analytical. He says, I look at successive census data. And he makes the same causation pains to us. Yes, disposable incomes are rising. Women are becoming a powerful influencer, if not a decision maker in many cases. And he says, 
this over-reliance on the family jeweler. India was buying jewelry from the family jeweler. But because movement had started, the IT industry was sort of growing, women were getting displaced, people were moving from their hometowns. We said, the time is right, let's see. Why should you continue to buy jewelry from your family jeweler? Everything that we did in Titan, let's do it for branded jewelry. If you can buy branded apparel, if you can buy branded watches, if you can buy branded FMCG, CPG, why don't you buy branded jewelry? So the same logic, great designs, sold in a great ambiance, and Tanish, I remember because at that point of time I was in India today and we covered the first uh, Tanish launch of Stella Maris College. Uh, it was a very slick affair and it bombed because they were selling 18 karat uh, gold and diamonds. Um, and the Indian woman wasn't ready. He says, we realize something fundamental that we want to take uh, jewelry and we want to do a Tanishkaization of it. I mean, sell it good quality jewelry and all that. But don't push the envelope so far that you go beyond the customer's comfort zone. Push it a bit, but don't break it. So they do a lot of mid-course corrections. They do it. So he, he goes back to 22 carats. He uses traditional jewelry. And, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that actually has happened in the back end. There's uh, something called uh, a Karigar Park in Hosu, where he brings traditional jewelry and hosts them in a, in a, in a neat factory environment. I've seen that. Uh, in fact, uh, again, like the Infosa story, it's all very transparent. You can go to the Titan showroom, and you can see videos of the Karigar Park. It's a fascinating place. So there are these traditional jewelers, and if you know in your hometowns, a traditional jeweler works in the dingy alleys with uh, toxic fumes and all that. That whole expertise has been brought into a modern air-conditioned factory sort of set up. He says, it works for me, because the productivity has gone up huge. So whatever I, uh, cost I incur there, I gain hugely in productivity and output. And, and, and then, you know, Atanishka is now a great brand. So he says, you know, market research was telling us that yes, the transition may be happening, family jeweler to branded stores, but it was happening to, let's say, a GRT in a Chennai, or a TVZ in a Bombay, or a Trivandas, or whatever. In different cities, there will be one big guy. And uh, there was so much of demand that there were huge crowds and stuff like that. So he says, market research was telling us that let's do another GRT, a GRT clone, or a TVZ clone. We looked at the data and we took our own call, which was to do something different. He says, that has sort of happened in this company. I don't know what to call it. but And he says, it's ephemeral. If you talk to my managers, if you talk to any brand manager, they'll sound like the Hindustan liver guys. I mean, they, they'll speak about market share and this and that. But a product discussion comes and suddenly all hell breaks loose. Everyone's very passionate. And you know, he said, that seems to be the DNA of this company. And, and, and he, he was breaking us how to sort of institutionalize this. This is a problem that all managers in this book have faced. I mean, if you're a manager, how do you institutionalize something that is so gun true? And, 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 and being a quanti sort of a professional manager, he actually takes steps to do that. I'll detail that. How do you sort of marry this very uh, rigorous market research approach to this intuitive need? Uh, and, and this is what actually a lot of brand consultant advertising agencies, all of them do. I mean, there's a whole bunch of research that comes out. And then how do you make a creative leap to take that research into anything? It could be a logo, a campaign, whatever, or a product. He, he calls it collective dreaming, and he's got a whole bunch of uh, things to enable that. Parts of it, elements of that, of that are, uh, he makes people own it. So, you know, uh, a young guy, Go, and go back to the Ratan Tata story. A young guy can put up an idea, but it can't be a airy, fairy, loose thing. You have to take ownership. We will give you resources. And it's up to you to drive that. There is a KRA and a delivery rule attached to it. I, I see that happening in company after company. It happens in Amerigo, for instance, a guy I've covered. So, so they give young people or an ambitious guy a responsibility, but they also make him accountable. 
And they say it's not going to be easy because you have to work on dotted relationships to people across silos. But hey, if, if, if it happens, it's big. And that's your, and, and you ask for it. I mean, if you're a, and this is the conventional definition of a product manager. If you're a product manager, you asked for it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not an easy job. Um, I don't want to bore you, so uh, I, I really want to talk about Raghav Bell. I can talk about Kiran Majidla, but let me talk about uh, Raghav Bell because he brings a completely different perspective. Because in the first innings, we built a lot, but we also made a lot of mistakes. Uh, and therefore, there was that nagging thought that maybe you need to do it once more, but do it without the mistakes. Expand that. So why mistakes? You know, lots of mistakes. Because when you're a first generation entrepreneur, uh, you really don't understand uh, the value of the kind of processes which come, you know, uh, say financial processes, say equity placement, say premium calculations. I think when you are in the early 90s, we didn't know all of these things in India. So I believe I did sell myself very short. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just did not have the balance sheet strength to support the ambition that we had. I found Raghavil fascinating. He, he was the guy who started CNBC, ET, and CNN. And a whole bunch of online and television properties. Uh, he grew very, very fast. Um, I've got some number there. He said he grew from 100 pros in 2005 to 6,000 pros in 2040. And uh, what Z and Star had done over 25 years, this guy did in, in a half the time. The thing was, and, and when he says this, you know, it's this is something that would be so relevant to any entrepreneur, any aspiring leader. Remember, he's not a naive guy. I mean, he's the son of an IS officer, he's a Stephanian, he's got an MBA from FMS. So this is a guy who was fully geared to understand business, he's trained for it. Um, and still he says that, you know, I don't know what hit me. <laughs> and I think that's the difference between uh, talking about swimming from being on the side of the pool and actually swimming. When you experience it, life is different. He said, okay, the bullet that hit me was in my industry, that was broadcast television, there was a government rule that the promoter needed to maintain 51%. Had I been in pharma, had I been in IT, I would have been, you know, just hunky dory. Because if my business grew, all I had to do was dilute, get money, and that's exactly what I was done. In his industry, uh, growth came, but for every rupee that an investor put, he had to put another rupee because of the 15% loss, and that killed it. So by 2000, uh, 2011, the guy has accumulated 1,400 crores of debt. So he says, I'm dead. Now he's bailed out uh, through multiple chains by, by Reliance Industries who take, who buy interventions, and they said, okay, over a 10-year period, at some point in time, we'll convert that into shares. Uh, and the, the, the company runs, and, and Reliance converts those into shares in two years. So that's it. So they take control of this company, exit Raghav Behel. But Raghav Behel goes out with a payout of 700 crores. He said, all right, uh, you know, he's a perfectly nice guy. He said, I could have sat in my house in Noida, played golf, and become angel investor. But he says, this is this this kept bugging me that you know I wish I could do it again because I've made mistakes. That's exactly what he did. And he starts Quint. Now I don't know if, if you read Quint, but Quint is he positions it as uh, uh, media for the social first, digital native young consumer, people who consume uh, content on a smartphone. Um, and, and he's going about it in a certain way. So, so there's stuff that he talks about how, you know, he's not doing things fundamentally different in content because media has to show you news. But it, it is shown in digestible uh, bites. Uh, there's a lot of video in it. It's young. It's peppy. And there is, he's, he's trying this experiment. Of, he says, print is dead. Uh, and a lot of print journalism, frankly, is very corrupted. Uh, a lot of television journalism is frankly corrupted. 
So there's this whole market symbolized by a CNN.com or an ADTV.com where you're marrying television because for breaking news, you're always going to rely on television. Something happens, an explosion happens, you want to see what. And then there is a uh, 360 degree commentary around it. So if you can marry online uh, and, 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 and TV, then you've got a winning combination because you see multiple perspectives, multiple windows can be open, streaming video, social media content from, from people on the ground can be incorporated, all of that. The other part he's done, the non-visible part, is he's also uh, funding a startup called Quintype. Quintype is the platform. So like WordPress is a platform. So Quintype is a platform on which you know Quint is running on Quintype, but tomorrow other people also can run Quintype. So this is a guy a media savvy entrepreneur with a track record. In today's age, uh, he's got the money, he's got the technology, and that's a great story. In fact, uh, I spoke to media critics like Seva D9 and all that. And he's not the only guy. I mean, there are, there are, there are properties like scroll.in and the wire.in, which are again started by journalists, which is the so-called independent media today. They are not driven by isms, and so far they don't have uh, obvious biases, um, but this is the guy who's got the money because all of them are struggling. So this is a guy who's got the money, he's got the intent, and he's got the technology to do it. So I thought he'd be a great sort of um, example. Um, all right, I, 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 they have got this tunnel vision. They know what they want to achieve, and they're going to get there. They're ruthless guys. So make no mistake about it. Um, and, and, and the, the funny thing was, let's say, uh, uh, Kiran Majumdar Shah, as an Infosys director, she says a few things. You know, the board is right and Moti was wrong and all. You, you, you scratch her a bit and talk to her about her company, and you see the passion. And she's, she's very sure that a Biocon, which, by the way, had a huge, long gestation period because they were getting into this difficult thing called biosimilars, and says, you know, how many people have come to me and says, Kiran, you know, we don't believe your story, this is rubbish, you're spending too much on R&D, why don't you buy technology, we're not seeing the need of hope, there is no excitement. So he says, I have spent decades of my life saying, I don't want to listen to those rubbish guys, bear with me, something will happen. And today her biosimilars are hitting the market, it's coming out in Japan, it's coming out in Europe, and investors realize she's the only game in town in India, I mean, there's Pfizer and all elsewhere. But he says, had I left it to a professional manager, this company would have been dead. Uh, so there are entrepreneurs who have that. I mean, the, the, the classical Steve Jobs kind of bullheadedness. I think I found that as a trait. Those were the common themes. Then I found that, are they, is there one way to do it? Of course there's not one way to do it. I mean, I asked questions like, all right, now all of you have grown companies, you reached a certain stage in life, you need to hand, hand over the baton, so to speak. So how do you institutionalize this? So people like um, Ratan Tata, people like Narayana Murthy, people like Suresh Krishna have told me, of course you can institutionalize it, and there are processes and things like that. I listen to them, and then I, and then I look at an Infosys with all that's wanted, Leadership Institute and things like that. And so obviously, he didn't choose people very well. And, you know, it, it didn't work out. Whereas you look at a, a company like GE, which has been there for 100 years, through multiple business cycles, through multiple uh, CEOs, and they seem to be cracking it. Uh, CEOs come and go, including the legendary folks like Jack Welch and all that. But the company goes on. On the other hand, there are people like Kiran Majumdar is a good example, William Bissell of Fabian is a good example, uh, who believe that you know companies need the fire of the founders because only a founder would have the perseverance and the sheer uh, guts uh, to actually take tough decisions and play for the long haul. Um, can a company do good and still be profitable? Companies like the Tata Group are struggling. I mean, they have a huge CSR outreach program. They build townships. They are sponsors of arts and medicine and healthcare and all that. But they're more, I mean, except for a handful of companies, the whole group financials are not very attractive to an analyst. On the other hand, uh, Devi Shetty of Narayana Hospitals, 
who actually I should have spoken about. He's a fascinating guy. Uh, he makes healthcare affordable, and uh, he continues to do good. And he has a stated belief, as I said, he says, this cannot be run as a charity. I need lots of money to expand. And the only way to do that is a public listed company. So there are some folks who seem to be managing that. He says, I'm not going to sell my, my stake. I'm there for the long haul. So I will pick up investors who believe my story. So at the end of the exercise, um, I decided there's no point trying to neatly summarize you know, a grand unified theory of innovation. Um, people are different, companies are different. It's just that something that Atata said, that when you are uh, small and you're very close to the company, then everything seems uh, very close to you, so you might have to do it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you tend to be very hands-on. But when you grow, how do you scale? There are people in that category. Uh, Ajiv Prasad of Dr. Reddy's lab says exactly that. He says, my big problem is that you know earlier when we had four factories all around Bachapalli or whatever, the Hyderabad surrounding areas, on a Sunday he would take his car and go around, talk to people, inspect it. And, and this whole thing over the MD coming and visiting you creates a buzz. He said, but that's no way to grow. Uh, Bayer and the Pfizer have grown because you know you have to scale and you have to put processes. And that's where his angst about the Jugard came in. He says, my problem is that uh, I'm trying my hardest. But still, people are cutting across the lawn. And <laughs> I'm getting in it. I'm metaphorically, I'm getting into an FDA soon. How do I crack that? If I can crack that, I have scaled. Um, I just want to end with this with this thing. Uh, you're free to read the article. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I found this interesting for one reason. When, when at the end of this exercise, I was trying to wrap my head around everything that I've heard. And I said, oh, this is fine. I mean, you can keep telling stories till kingdom come. But how do, you, how do you put a framework to this? Turns out that McKinsey has this, I found this interesting, it is essentials to innovation. And they say that these are essentials to innovation. He classifies it as aspire, and choose, discover, blah, blah, blah. The first four are enablers. He says, you, you have to have these to enable innovation in your company. And a few of them are actually commonsensical. When you say, uh, when you say uh, aspire, so, so, so you actually regard innovation as, as a must have. Uh, and, and, and this is not a given, because in many companies, life goes on. I mean, FMCG is a great example. Life goes on, uh, you know, in, Indians need soap and shampoo, so why should I disturb the status quo? Everything is going on. But all that, all that management stuff that we hear about, creative self-destruction, uh, has to happen, because otherwise, someone's going to eat you. Someone's going to come up with a better, or, or, or a lower cost of delivery, or a better supply chain, or a better distribution. <coughs> someone's going to eat you. And that's exactly, uh, by the way, what a SAP Labs does, or a Aditya uh, Puri does in HDFC Bank, is very sensitive to threats of disruption, and he quickly tries to incorporate that into his business. Uh, choose. This was a good thing. He says, the problem with companies is not that they don't have innovative ideas. The problem is that they have too many of them. Uh, you have smart people in your companies, and you have your brainstorming sessions, and your strategy meetings and all of that. Plenty of ideas come up. How do you choose which one to follow? Because remember, choosing is a hard task because then you have to put resources and that's what he says. I mean, do you have, uh, do you actually put money and people behind it? It's all very well to say that, you know, I've gone through this brainstorming exercise, exactly what the business props used to say. Um, and when we were invested in relation, there used to be a wonderful thing and old NCI prof came to us in Infosys and said, by all means, listen to the CEO. You might even learn something from him. But please, for heaven's sake, go to the balance sheet and see, have they put money into a new building, or a plant, or a factory, or a capex? Because that's when you know the rubber beats the road. So you know all of that stuff. And then uh, at the later part is all execution. So having done that, you know, all, all the traditional stuff about are you putting out products fast enough, something that which is indicated in the Nestle story, are you doing it with enough aggression? Is there a market for it? And all those famous things like, yes, there's a gap in the market, but is there a, is there a market in the gap? So that kind of stuff, and you put money behind it. 
this I thought was 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 a good way. And then I look back on the people I met in these and, and the narratives they told me. I was able to map a whole bunch of stuff into this. So this probably has as good a way of being. It's not the only way. I mean, I've come across uh, Boston Group and KPMGs. Many people have frameworks. But this probably seemed to me to be something that was easy to wrap your head around. Thank you very much for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Questions, I'd love to try and answer them. I keep thinking of the very first thing you said about Rashmi Dada, which is when he came back to India, he was uh, dismissed, if you will, by older people in the company saying, I think you have gray hair, you know, you know, do what you're told to do or the equivalent thereof. <coughs> so in a, in a very uh, patriarchal kind of society and culture, uh, did any of these people refer to that as a challenge that they have been with in enabling innovation to occur? Tata himself actually tries to address that. He said uh, in his first phase as a, as a rising manager, I mean, yes, the, the surname helped, but he was still an employee. Um, he said initially it was very hard. But there were practices. On paper, there were practices on the shop floor, like uh, you know, all, all factories have a workers' suggestion box where people put suggestions and stuff. Like. He says, I honestly made, try to make a go of it. And he said privately, you don't know how many countless hours I've sat there uh, taking those chits. And there's a committee and screen, and, and there's an incentivization. So if a suggestion comes from a worker, and you know, you, and you think it's viable, you put it into the plant, and the work is incentivized. And and like like all the Pareto principles, I mean, for every one there are there are 89 that you have to reject. So that's a tough process. He said. So things like that do exist on paper. It's a question of how much have you activated them, how much passion have you put behind them. That's one part. The other part, he said, and it's very difficult in a in a hierarchical setup, as you said. So he said. His greatest freedom was after he actually quit, uh, the first time he quit Tata's and turned into a, an angel investor. He said, now, because I'm not handling company money, as an angel, I have the freedom to actually put money uh, on, in, in projects that I believe in. So for instance, you know, he, he put money behind Team Indus. And he says, there are many Team Indus. I mean, people have come to him uh, you know, at airports in Singapore. In fact, when I was trying to get a invitation to Tata. So somebody told me he's got this fancy house in Bombay. Uh, so there's this whole culture of, of, of waiting for Ratan Tata outside his home and then you know, Sahab are in and he might actually give you an audience. And people have got funding like that. People have written to him and, and there's a guy there in Katama or somebody. But he says, I've tried to do that. Uh, institutionally, I think uh, a person like a Bhaskar Bhatt of Titan uh, seems to have have done that as a process in the company. Or, or that, that stuff that he talked about, bottom-up collective dreaming, is actually enabling um, people with ideas not to feel threatened by hierarchies. But you know, at the end of the day, you have a, you make a very very good point. Um, it is patriarchal because uh, you know when 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 I went to college, one of the most powerful statements in IIT Kanpur was the prof walks in and says, and says, call me Raj. And it's not as though, you know, I think it's fundamental. Because, I mean, he's a prof, and, and you know you've got to respect him. He's up there, you're a student. But he wants to consciously break down that hierarchy so that you can question. Uh, I, it, it has happened quite a bit in the IT industry uh, because, in fact, a guy like Dinesh Sharma of ATM makes a point. He says, I make it a point not to have an office. I sit in the cubicle and all that. It's not just drama because in my industry, a 24-year-old can have a technology idea. I mean, basically, it's a software-driven platform. Someone will have a great idea on a technology or a different way of doing things. And there's a natural tendency on part of the senior who's status quo is threatened to sort of shoot it down.